जनन आप आत्मनोहितम करोती भूयो विवशा प्रयश्चिता मतो खातम प्रयश्चिता Papam, simple criminal action. Janan, knowing, api, although, atmana, of his self, ahitam, injurious, karoti, buyaha, again and again. Vivasa, unable to control himself, prayaschitam, atonement, ato, therefore, katam, what is the value of? Go ahead, read the translation. Saving one from sinful acts, 
In the following verse, he further explains his rejection of this process. Om Magyana Timarandasya Kyananjana Shalakaya Chaksura Militan Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaihevacha Patita Nam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we're hearing this conversation between Maharaj Parikshit, Sukadeva Goswami. Maharaj Parikshit was concerned how to deliver the people from hell. How could people be saved from suffering in hellish conditions, such as in the hellish planets, at the bottom of the universe. There are different kinds of hell, like Kumbi Pakaloka. Kumbi Pakaloka, they have a big pot of boiling oil and people are put there into the boiling oil and baked, just like uh, people fry their food. You know, if you make pakoras or something, you put them into the boiling oil, hot oil. And so people are put into these kinds of hells, this punishment for their sins, especially like people who are killing and eating a lot of animal flesh, then they have to suffer that kind of hell. So Maharaj Parikshit was eager to save people from hell because he's a devotee and the devotees are full of compassion for the fallen conditioned souls. They're not thinking only about their own deliverance, but they want to deliver others. As Prahlad Maharaj says in seventh canto of the Bhagavatam that there are some people, they just want to go to the cave and sit in the cave and they just want to be delivered themselves. But Prahlad Maharaj said, I'm not like that. I don't, I, I don't want to just deliver myself, but I want to deliver others. I want to see other people are safe. And that's why devotees, that's why we're living in places like cities. Uh, we go into the bit area where the people are because we're concerned how to deliver others from their hellish, unfortunate conditions. So Maharaj Parikshit had this kind of compassion. And uh, we see the Lord also has this compassion. This compassion, of course, this is the quality of Lord Sri Krishna himself, that he is compassionate on the living entities. And this material world is the creation of the Lord. It's a manifestation of his compassion because he creates this material world so that we can be delivered from our material existence. The whole material creation is here for us that we can purify ourselves if we use everything properly. Everything which we have, it is actually the creation of the Lord. We ourselves are eternal living entities. We are not created. But the senses and the mind, the intelligence, the life air, all of these different things, all of the elements of the material nature, the earth, water and fire, air and ether, all these Mahabuddhis, they're all the creation of the Lord. And the Lord created all of these things to help us all to get out of our plight, out of our miserable condition in this material world. Actually, the Lord creates these things not to make us miserable. Some people think, why did the Lord create the world in such a, a miserable place that we're all suffering? But we don't have to suffer here, but we suffer because we don't follow the laws of the Lord. 
We're not following the laws by which we're meant to live in this world. The Vedic injunctions are there to guide people how to live. And if we live in the proper way, we won't suffer. We'll be happy. We'll, we can enjoy life. People have to learn how to enjoy. Of course, people have the, their idea of enjoyment is so degraded that it's not according to the Vedic injunctions. Their idea of enjoyment is to go against all the Vedic injunctions. And that's why they suffer. So Sukadeva Goswami was suggesting here to Maharaj Parikshit that you should do atonement, do prayaschit. But Maharaj Parikshit is not satisfied with this. He is a thoughtful, intelligent person, and he can understand that simply doing some atonement is not going to stop people from sins. And we, of course, we know from our own experience in the world how people are addicted to sinful activities. They do things, and even they, after doing things, they, they regret it. Oh, I, did, I shouldn't have done that. I really, I'm such a rascal. I'm so fallen. They, they think like that. They say like that, and then still they go ahead and do it because their senses are uncontrolled. They have no control over their mind and senses. It's not their karma, but it's their own foolishness. It's their own ignorance. They're in this helpless condition. They're in this condition that they're not able to understand properly what is the prop what is the actual proper activities for civilized human beings. So Maharaj Parikshit wants to hear from Sukadeva Goswami some other alternative rather than just atonement. Because he knows that just simply doing some atonement, it's not enough. It doesn't stop. The cycle of sinful activities is endless. Of, in the Bhagavad Gita, we see also Arjuna asking his question to Lord Krishna, by what is one impelled to sinful activities, even unwilling, as if engaged by force? So it's like that. You do things even unwilling, as if by force. And of course, the problem is, last, it is lust only, O Arjuna, born of contact of the material mode of passion, and later transformed into wrath, which is the all-devouring sinful enemy in this world. And that lust is described that it burns like fire and is never satisfied. And how to conquer, and the, oh, then the, the seating places of lust is also given, that it's situated in the senses, it's in the mind, and it's even in the intelligence. Even our intelligence can be polluted by lust. How careful we have to be to guard against this enemy lust. So Lord Krishna himself, of course, goes on to give the, the solution how we can conquer over this enemy lust. He by regulating the senses and by cultivating transcendental knowledge, then we can curb this all-devouring enemy. So the process of sense control is required. And awakening transcendental knowledge. And Prabhupada in the purport gives the example, he said just like people uh, are given instruction that it's wrong to commit crimes, it's wrong to steal, it's wrong to do harm to others. Uh, there, there's so many different things, laws are there and we're meant to follow the law. Laws are for human beings. Laws are not for animals, as we said before. The animals, they are controlled by the laws of nature. But the human beings are given some free will. They're expected to be intelligent. And use, they're expected to use their intelligence 
to control the senses and to follow laws. And therefore, you see, everywhere in the world, there are laws. There are different laws. Which side of the road to drive on? There are laws about throwing litter. There are laws about doing things like... Uh, uh, Prabhupada said, Prabhupada said uh, when he was a young man, it happened somehow he had a, a, a call of nature and he passed urine outside a police station. <laughs> and somehow he didn't realize it was a police station. The policeman came out and, and they, and they uh, reprimanded him and he was given a fine and he had to pay a fine, you know, a few rupees or something. But, but he describes like that. They have these kind of laws, you know. So there are laws for the human beings. The law, there are no laws for the animals. The laws themselves are built into the animal's nature. What they will eat and how they will mate. In certain times of the year, there are the mating season. There's a spawning season for fish when they will go and spawn. In Russia, they have all these salmon, the salmon fish, and they, they go up and there's certain times of the year when they go to spawn. And so like this is, by nature, they're impelled to do these different things. And so human nature is also there. But human nature is, it, it's meant to be controlled. There's meant to be regulation there. So these are, these are laws which we're meant to follow. But common people don't like to follow laws. People think, sometimes when we tell people about being vegetarian, that some, sometimes they will say, yes, I'm free, I can eat whatever I like. They say, you, you're, you have to, you don't eat this, you don't eat that, you're so particular what you will eat and what you won't eat. It's, but they say, I'm free. I can eat whatever I like. And what do they eat? Of course, they eat the most garbage kind of food, the most nonsense things. And they're thinking that is their freedom. Actually, that is not their freedom. That is the law, modes of nature which are controlling them to act in that manner. The, mode of na the modes of nature, rajagun and tamagun, the modes of passion and ignorance, are forcing them to eat these different kinds of foods which are sinful, which are just simply uh, the mode of manifestations of their passion and ignorance. So they're thinking they're free. But actually, they are controlled by the modes, the lower modes of nature. Devotee is also controlled. Yes, devotees are controlled, but not controlled by passion and ignorance. The devotees are controlled by the mode of goodness. They're fixed in the mode of goodness, and they will eat the proper food which is prescribed according to regulated principles. So the materialistic people, they say, oh, you're not free. They are thinking they're free. That is their illusion. They're not free. They're just controlled. They're the slave of their uncontrolled mind and senses. And the nature of that, it's, it's due to the contamination of lust. Because they're so overwhelmed by lust, they engage in all kinds of sinful activities and they're never satisfied because it's the nature of lust that it burns like fire. The more you put fuel on the fire, the more it burns. You don't put it up. Some people think, oh, I'll do, I'll do this, I'll eat that and I'll satisfy my senses. But no, they're never satisfied because they act on the platform of their own lust and they just simply go on and do the same si sins. The same sins are performed again and again and again and become more and more addicted. Just like someone was saying to me 
uh, they were saying, the, the, the Christian priest had said to them, oh, drink, but don't get drunk. Don't drink too much. You know, drink, but don't drink too much. Don't get drunk. And so, of course, people will go and drink, and, you know, oh, I'm not, I'm not drunk. Oh, I'm not, you know, they would say, I'm not drunk. And, and, and then they'll say, don't drink too much. Yeah, I'm not drinking too much, you know. They drank so much, but they say, no, no, I didn't drink much, no, no, like this. And so they, <laughs> this is the kind of uh, thinking which goes on in the minds of common people. And they're, they're led like, they're misled by so-called evangelic and missionary people teaching them like this. Drink, but don't get drunk. Gamble, but don't gamble too much. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, um, people go to the casino, everybody's thinking, I want to win, I want to win, and everyone loses. Practically nobody wins. But people go to casino, they, and this is their life. They, they just get so much pleasure from gambling their fortunes away. So these kind of activities are going on. People are misled into thinking that what we're doing is okay. Everyone does it. Everyone eats meat. Everywhere there's this fried chicken and that fish and eggs and everywhere. It's everywhere. So what's the harm if I'm also doing it? I'm just like everybody else. So, you know, people are in that kind of trap. They don't think that the blind are following the blind. They don't see that. They can't see their own ignorance. And they don't want to see it even. We try to awaken them. They don't want to see it. And so people are told it's wrong to steal. If you steal, you suffer. And people know it. But still there's so many people in the prison. There are so many there are so many criminals, and more and more criminals. Although they know it was wrong to steal, they keep stealing, and they go to prison and they suffer, and they come out, and they keep stealing and again go back to prison. They never learn, and like that, people suffer for their sins. There are so many ways in which people suffer for their sinful activities, different diseases which they get. I, I was talking yesterday about these sexual diseases which people get. But even though they get the disease, they never give up the lust. They can never give up that lust which is there, which is in the, in the, in the body. They don't know how to purify that lust, how to, how to counteract that lust. So this is the importance of spiritual education. We try to educate people how to control the mind and senses, how to conquer lust, to do these things. Just like uh, Prabhupada uh, went to Geneva, in Switzerland, and when he was in Geneva, the devotees there, at that time they had a temple in Geneva, and they'd opened this temple, and there was a lot of interest in Krishna consciousness. And so the mayor, the Prabhupada met with the mayor of Geneva, and the mayor asked Prabhupada, he said, the mayor said, you know, I'm just worried that in the future there will be so many Hare Krishnas that nobody will work. Everyone will be singing and dancing. Everyone will be chanting and dancing. Nobody will work. <laughs> the mayor was worried that how will we maintain the society if everyone becomes Hare Krishna devotee? He was actually thinking like that. And so Prabhupada laughed. He thought it was funny. Just like we offer Krishna consciousness to people and we tell people, come and eat, come and people say, no, I have to work, I have to eat. If I don't work, how will I eat? We say, oh, come to the temple, we have prasadam. No, 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 I have to work. 
And, and they go off to their factory and they spend the whole day in their factory. And they say, look, we told you, just come to the temple, we have nice prasadam, you could come. Oh, no, no, I have to go to factory. You go to work in the factory, spend the whole day and working in some hellish condition, breathing some hellish air. And they're thinking, I have to do this. This is my duty. Actually, people don't have to do these things. There are alternatives to life. But people are just so, they're so blind, they're so much in ignorance, and they're so much the servant of their senses, that they cannot understand that there's some positive alternative to the life in which they're living at this moment. And the positive alternative, of course, is to take up spiritual practice to engage in, sp in activities for the pleasure of the soul, to hear and chant. People will say, I don't like it. I don't like to read. I don't like to chant. Yeah, you don't like it in the beginning, but if you do it, gradually you'll get to like it. Right? It's, it's like that. Just like in the beginning, people smoke cigarettes, they don't like it, but they keep doing it, and they get, they think, I, I'm enjoying this. They actually think, I'm enjoying this. And they're drinking alcohol, and they think, I'm enjoying this. Although it's the most horrible things, the most unpleasant things, which simply do harm and give bad health, but they're thinking, oh, this is my pleasure. So this is the, their ignorance. People are so much in ignorance. How to save them? It's a difficult job. And Prabhupada certainly knew, very difficult. Prabhupada went to America in the 60s. So many young people, drug addicts and hippies and, and then alcoholics were there also. So what was the program? Simply chant Hare Krishna and distribute prasadam. And later on, of course, Prabhupada moved to San Francisco, and at that time there were there was so many young people there. So how to help them? Chant Hare Krishna and Prasadam. These two things very, very important, very powerful. We have nice prasada and we have nice kirtan. And then people who get these two things, they can be changed. Their lives can be saved from the hell and the ignorance in which they're living in. They can be brought to a, a they can become sane. They may not be devotees. They may not dedicate their life to the service of Krishna, but they can understand something of a better life, which is there in spiritual practice. So we cannot expect that the whole world will take up Krishna consciousness, but we can benefit the world by chanting Hare Krishna and distributing prasadam. And of course we distribute also transcendental literature, which is also very wonderful, most wonderful, to give transcendental literature. If people can get a book and read it, then that's something very, very wonderful. And it certainly can make them sane, it can bring them to cultivate transcendental consciousness. So Krishna consciousness is in everyone. We say Krishna's in the heart of all living entities. It's just a question of somehow getting them and attracting them to Krishna consciousness, making it appealing. Just like Prabhupada wrote that very nice offering to his spiritual master, and he, he, he described the work of his spiritual master. He said, oldest of all, but in new dress, miracle done, your divine grace. Prabhupada describing 
Om Vishnupad Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, that he did a miracle. The oldest of all, the oldest, the Vedic knowledge, the Vedic culture, from the beginning of creation, the Vedic knowledge was given to Lord Brahma. So that same thing, very old, the ancient thing, but he put it into a new dress. He made it attractive to people that they would also want it. And he attracted many people and they took up Krishna consciousness. And similarly, Srila Prabhupada also continued the same work to attract people. He wanted to see that the people are somehow, they're being attracted, they're taking an interest in Krishna consciousness. And so we are always thinking how to give Krishna consciousness to others. We don't just simply want to sit here in peace and solitude, but we want the place to become a Mecca. It should, there should be, a, you know, always people, there should be, we want to attract the public, that they will come and take an interest in the activities of Krishna consciousness. And, so, and certainly there are people out there looking or waiting for that opportunity to get the contact with devotees. So our, our job is really to go out there and find them and bring them to Krishna. Prabhupada always wanted to know, how many books have you distributed? How many properties have you acquired? And how many devotees have you made? He want, wants to see that the movement is expanding because if it doesn't expand, it will simply go down. <laughs> right? It has to go forward. You have to go, f the example of the arrow, you fire an arrow, it has to go forward. If it's not going forward, it will simply go down. And so like that, if we don't keep our Krishna conscious temples active, then it will simply go down, it will just dry up. So we have to always be thinking, we must be constantly racking our brains how to expand this Krishna consciousness movement. And it's very amazing to see all the devotees coming in the temples in India. There are many, many young men, all young men, in the, temples in India, and so many temples as well. And they have so many uh, centers, and they rent property, they have bases everywhere, and they get so many people, and they get good people as well. You know, they're getting educated young men, often they get people from the colleges, and they get them involved in Krishna consciousness, they will rent sometimes a place near to the college so that the students who are going to college will come there and have the prasadam and they have programs. But, you know, the, the congregation is just huge there in, in, the, in India nowadays. So they've just got so many devotees and they're very active. And, and nowadays, of course, these devotees who've been doing a lot of this preaching, now they're expanding, they're going out and they're going off to America and they're meeting people there because a lot of Indian people also go to America to study. So they go to America too and meet them in America and, they, you know, people who maybe they knew when they were in India and they knew them from India and then they went off to America to study, to do postgraduate or to do graduate studies. And then they go to America and they go and meet them in America and they have a lot of programs going on there too. And so people may say, oh, there's not many devotees in America. Actually, the devotees are there. You just don't see them, you know. And Prabhupada it's not that devotee always has to be in Dovti and Kurta. It's not required. The dress is not so important. You go to the West, you know, all right. You're in the West and people, you know, they're 
they have a job or they're studying and like that, you know, they dress like other people. It's not a problem. But they act, they're devotees, they're chanting and they're associating with devotees regularly. So like this, uh, we need to also think how to attract more the youth, the young people, our future devotees. We cannot think, oh, our movement's going to stop. We're all getting older. Any time we may leave the body, who's going to take over? We have to get the, we have to bring up the youth and give them responsibilities and get them to come forward and take up in a more active manner Krishna consciousness. This is uh, our task. We have to think what has to be done in order to attract them. Certainly we have a lot to offer. We have wonderful jewels, right? The treasure of the the Vedic literature, the Vedic culture, it's a treasure. It's, it's the most valuable thing. It's there for them. If they, we just, we have to, you know, we, we have a treasure. Sometimes people have a treasure. They, they, they hide it. Don't want to show it to anybody. They may steal it from me. <laughs> like we worry like that, that maybe they'll take it from me. But no, we have to think how to distribute Krishna consciousness. It is said when Lord Krishna came, he brought with him a storehouse of love of God, but the contents were kept locked. But when Lord Chaitanya came with the Panchatattva, they broke open the storehouse and they plundered the contents and they distributed it everywhere. And there was no scarcity. The more they distributed it, the more the supply increased hundreds of times. So, Jai, Jagannath Baladev Subhadra Ki Jai. There's no question of scarcity. We don't have to worry about, oh, the temple will become too crowded. <laughs> My goodness, I. Yeah. When I, when I joined the movement the, the, in, the, in the 1970s, the temples were so crowded, you can't believe it. I remember our New York temple, you could hardly find a, a space on the floor to lay down. You know, the whole floor was just covered with men, you know. <laughs> it was amazing. Anyway, uh, those days, times change, but still, it's the same program, Krishna Consciousness. And it is an all-attractive program. We just have to present it in a manner which somehow can captivate the minds of people. We may say, oh, the mothers and fathers, they don't want their children to become full-time devotees. Well, in the 1970s and 60s, mothers and fathers also didn't want the children to become full-time devotees. There was even the, the deprogramming going on. It was so bad that mothers and fathers were hiring people to come and deprogram their children from being devotees. So the situation hasn't really changed. If people want to become devotees, they can become devotees. Who cares? Mothers and fathers. <laughs> mother, oh, my mother won't like it if I become a full-time devotee. Who cares what your mother thinks? You know? <laughs> You've got to do it. You've got to go forward. You've got to become Krishna conscious. So everyone has that choice, they have that free will. Okay, any question, comment?
Yes, Shanti Prabhu. <laughs> what about devotees who are under the influence of the three modes? Yes. Well, association. You have to get good association. You have to put yourself into the right atmosphere. You want to get out of the modes, you want to come to the higher level, or bring yourself out of passion and ignorance and come up to goodness. You've got to, you've got to have that desire. If you really want you can do it. Desire is very important. And then association. Get the right association. Put yourself into the right atmosphere. And you can do it. I mean, you can do it anywhere. But we have to have that desire. It's based on our desire. What do we want? We say, man proposes, God disposes. You want to be a devotee in the mode of passion or ignorance? Yeah, you can do it. But you don't have to remain in passion and ignorance. We have to come out of that. We have to come up, to bring ourselves up first to the mode of goodness and then go on to pure goodness. So that desire is very important. We have to have that strong desire that I really want to do this. You know, just like becoming a devotee sometimes, it's difficult in the beginning, becoming a devotee, you know. Do I really want to be a devotee? Oh, I don't know. I'm, I, do I want to go like this, you know. Well, like what we used to do, to go singing and dancing, and every day we used to do kirtan, and I, I don't know, should I do this? I don't know, people will think I'm crazy, you know. So you have to be convinced, you have to have faith that what you're doing is right. And then you have to have that desire that I'm going to do it. I have to do it. It's essential, yes, we have to have, I mean if we have that faith, if we're really convinced, we can do it. Just get yourself into the right mood, get yourself in, into gear, you know. <laughs> Get the, put yourself in gear and then you can go forward. Don't just sit rev revving the accelerator. You've got to put yourself into gear, then the car will start to move. So you got to, we've got to get going. We have to be constantly aware. The modes of nature are always there. And maya is always there. Maya is always trying to lure us, to grab us, to pull us down. And the mind is always trying to trick us. That, oh, you don't need to do it. There's nobody there. There's nobody interested. There's really nobody interested to be a devotee. There's no, don't bother Prabhu. No, don't take your time. No, it's not worth it. Just go back to sleep. Like that, you know, the mind will always try to trick us and discourage us and tell us that, oh, it's useless, nobody's interested. Devotees were saying to Prabhupada, yeah, nobody's interested. Prabhupada said, yeah, they weren't interested when I went to America either. But I didn't give up. The situation hasn't changed. It's the same material world. It's the same modes of nature. It's the same lust, greed and anger and everything. Nothing's really changed. We just have to be very determined. We have to have that desire. And then it can happen. And you can see Devotees like Jananda Maharaj went to Paris and now in France, Fr France had become socialist for some time. Socialist means people were mostly atheistic. Although generally it's a Catholic country, people are religious, 
but somehow it became socialist and people became atheistic. And we had, at one point, in Prabhupada's time, they had, it was booming. There were many devotees, many nice people joined. They made many devotees and so on. And then somehow, the, you know, because the guru fell down, and the guru fell down, when the guru had difficulties, then everybody dwindled and disappeared and went different places. When somehow the whole preaching mood changed. And so then Jananda Maharaj, had, he went again after a long time and he gradually built it up. And how do you build it up? Do sankirtan, distribute books, and give out invitations, make programs, and gradually come, it picks up. People, people start to come. You make devotees. And it just takes one sincere soul to keep going, to just go on and gradually more, another soul will come, another one, you get more and more, build up. Well, for them, yes, it's their atonement. In their f tradition, that is their atonement. I have another uh, uh, joke. Is it? My friend tells me, Julie, um, I think you can eat chicken. Because chicken is vegetarian, they take corns. <laughs> How do I answer him, Guru Yes, chickens eat corn. Right. Chickens eat worms also. <laughs> huh? Chickens eat worms also. They eat worms also. <laughs> okay, that's a good answer. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Prima. Yes. Okay, Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Srila Prabhupada.